end, uh, this is why I always insist uh, not to mention the word apprentice um, for the study of calligraphy, but to uh, use the word student or talebe. In the same way, we wouldn't say apprentice for the art of tajweed or any of the other Islamic sciences. And this is really what sets calligraphy apart um, as a, a noble art. So the, the system that we follow, um, all right, so the system of learning is based on the relationship between the master and student, and it's not fixed on a standard time for learning or a fixed quantity of texts to be written. Um, the method is really adapted um, for each student. So some students may acquire their ijaz after four years, some after 20 years, and it really depends on, on how, how fast uh, they learn. Um, so it is a student who chooses the master and humbly requests to be admitted as a disciple. It is the student's desire which creates the impulse to start on this path. So going back to the word talebe, student, um, it is significant that in Turkish, the word for student is talebe, and the verb taleb etmek means to request or to desire. And it is really uh, very important that this desire comes from the student. Um, there's a very famous Turkish saying that says, Ashk olmadan mesh kolmaz, meaning without intense love, there are no lessons, there is no meshk. Meshk is the, the practice that we do regularly as calligraphers. So really everything starts with this desire from the student, which will um, trigger the student to go and look for a teacher. So most masters, because of this, they, they follow the principle of never rejecting a student. And with time, uh, it will be the, the discipline itself, uh, the discipline of calligraphy, which will determine which students will continue and which students will give up after a few months. So as in the traditional system of learning, the presentation, there's also no exchange of, of money, since the, the main payment is the dedication of the student for his or her studies and the obedience to the master's instructions. So in the first lesson, this is, um, an, Sorry, I'm just going to go back to the image. This is an image of um, my first teacher, Mohammed Zakiria, and his teacher, um, Hassan Chalevi, in the background. Um, and as you can see, um, the relationship of master-students still continues, even though they are both um, in their 70s. Um, and here is uh, an image of a typical class uh, in Istanbul, where you see the teacher correcting the lessons and all the students um, uh, looking. The, the central um, teacher in the, in the center is Daud Bektash, also one of my, my, my masters. This is an image of Daud Bektash with um, the very great master Ali Al Parslan, who passed away um, a few years ago, and who was a great master of uh, Nastalik uh, Turkish style. So in the first lesson, the master um, will cut the first kalam for the student, a dried reed, which is cut at an angle, depending on the style of script to be written. The reed is cut and opened towards the heart in the Ottoman school. I know in the Iranian school, they open um, towards the exterior. Um, and contrary to what most people assume, uh, the first lesson that the master writes is not a single letter, but a sentence, a prayer. Um, and here you can see here on the top um, the prayer, Rabbi Yasser Walatu Asir, and Rabbi Tamim Bil Khair, Oh my Lord, make it easy and do not make it difficult. Oh my Lord, make it end well. And it is very symbolic that this is the first praise that the student writes because it's a sort of rite of passage uh, of sorts in which the student will write this, um, this sentence minimum for 40 days. As you know, the number 40 is very sim symbolic um, also in the, in the mystical tradition. So once this, but normally the student writes this for much more than 40 days. And 
sometimes it may take years. And for instance, Hassan Chalevi, the, the great master, the picture I showed you earlier, um, wrote this sentence for, for two years uh, until finally he was almost going to give up on philosophy and then his master needed to give him the, the next lesson. So um, after writing this, this sentence, um, let's go back. The, uh, the master um, shows the system of measuring the letters with the nocta, as you know, the point of the kalam, which is the measuring unit for the letters. And he will also indicate the inclination of the words on the page. The student will go home and practice writing this sentence many times until the next class when he will show the master and receive corrections. And this process will be repeated many times until the master deems fit to pass the student to the next lesson. And it's important also to know that, for instance, the, the student will never write in front of the teacher. Uh, the student, all when you visit the master, the master will only correct and then the student will observe the corrections of all the other students and then go home and practice very much in an individual uh, practice until he sees his teacher again and again uh, receive the corrections. So um, the difficulty of writing this sentence uh, as a first lesson uh, is obviously great you know, because the student will be struggling with the materials, the kalam, the ink, the paper. And this lesson seems almost like, a, like an impossible mountain uh, to climb. So in a sense, in writing this lesson, the student will become more and more conscious of the, the enormity of the task ahead. And since it is a prayer, he, will, he or she will become even more conscious of the fact that without the aid of God, we cannot accomplish anything. So it is also, um, in a sense, the beginning of this relationship with the teacher and the student where this element of submission to the teacher will also be um, very important. And it's, it is in this sense that it is really an initiatic um, exercise of sorts. So after months of practice, um, and this is here, it's a very uh, beautiful example of um, kara lama. In Turkish, kara means black, and this is blackening the page. So kara lama means to blacken the page, to, to, to fill all the space with your calligraphic exercise. Um, and this is by Shevki Efendi, a very famous uh, calligrapher from the 19th century. Uh, who represents one of the, um, the main masters that we follow uh, in terms of models and examples. And here, as you can see, um, are all the letters. You see the Rabbi Yasser, you see the beginning of certain letters, and you see the beginning of the certain connections with Jim. And here we see two styles. We see the Thuluf style and the Nesir style and the smaller script. So once a student has done the individual letters, um, they will pass on to connections. So they will connect. Sorry, let me just go back here. If you see here in the bottom, after having written the Rabbi Yasser, um, you will see in the bottom there is the Alif, Ba, Ta, Jim, Dal, Ra, Sin, uh, Shin. And as you can see, when we study the alphabet, we only study the letter forms, because of course uh, you can have ba, ta, tha, or jim, ha, ha, no, but, but here it's really a question of writing the different forms for each, for each basic um, letter. Once this has uh, been done and, and the calligrapher, the student has passed on to the next lesson, they will connect um, the initial letter with the final letter. So ba, alef, ba, 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 jim, ba, dal, etc. And they will do this uh, with every letter. This is actually the first lesson that I showed uh, my teacher, Daud Bektash. And here you can see the corrections in red and uh, different notes um, that one of my friends noted. It was at the time when I still didn't speak Turkish. And he did a very nice signature at the, the bottom here. You see uh, Daud Bektash Kapurullah with a date. <laughs> so um, after. This will continue with the next. Here you see the connections with Jim, Jim Rhein, uh, Jim Fa, and so on. 
And uh, once this is um, once this has been uh, finished, we call this uh, the mufredat, meaning the connections of, of the letters. Um, the student will start to write sentence sentences, and um, the first uh, in the curriculum, because as you can see, this is a curriculum. It's a very well established method that goes back um, a few centuries. Um, they will start writing a poem, which is called the Alef Kassidesi, in which each uh, line starts with a letter of the alphabet. And it's a poem um, to the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this will be written also. So this, all in all, a student who works really hard, uh, you know, for five to eight hours a day, they will be able to finish this main part of the curriculum after, let's say, uh, two years for a very accomplished student, and some students may take uh, four or five or, or more. Um, so once this main part of the curriculum is, is uh, established, the student will then start writing um, different pieces, uh, copying the masters, and then slowly uh, start creating their own, um, their own compositions. Um, and I will speak more about this uh, later, but um, it's really, uh, as you can see, the whole, the whole method of, of learning um, calligraphy is based first on taklid, on copying, but then there's a very important step, which is to create something new within the canons of the classical calligraphy, and this is where the challenge lies. Um, but it's very important for the art to, to stay alive and not to become, uh, you know, ju just um, a mere copy of the, the past masterworks. So after, as you can see at the beginning, the student has been writing with the smaller columns. And then once um, they have finished the curriculum, they will start writing with the larger columns. And this is also sometimes people think that writing larger is easier at the beginning. But in fact, because we are learning the proportions for the eye, it is much easier to learn proportions with the smaller, and then from small work to the larger to the larger size. Size. And here you can see um, a composition which is with a larger kalam, also much more, more complex, uh, written on the traditional um, ahar paper, the, the paper which is treated with the different layers of starch and egg. And um, this is really towards the end of the, the journey of the student. So once this, the teacher sees that um, the student has reached a point, not, not of perfection <laughs> by no means, because as you know, calligraphy is really a, a lifelong journey, um, the teacher will decide um, if that the, whether the student is ready to write his or her ijaza. So the ijaza is actually a copy of a masterwork. It is not an original piece um, by the student. So the student will choose uh, one of the, the great masterworks of the great Ottoman masters and uh, try to reproduce produce it as, as close as possible. And they do not do this in front of the, of the master. Each student will work on this piece uh, for weeks or months and show his teacher until the teacher um, sees that, that it's ready to, to be um, accepted. And then, as you can see in this example, this is a copy of a very famous kita. Kita is a term um, to indicate a combination of the two scripts, the Thuluth and the Nesir, with the smaller columns. And as you can see in the bottom, uh, the bottom right and the bottom left are the signatures of the two masters that this student had. Um, and the, the prayers that are uh, contained in the signature are very beautiful because they, they give permission to the student to now uh, sign their works. They give permission to the student to teach calligraphy, and they will always mention the, mast the, the, the master's name and the master's master's name. So in a sense, it really is a, a point where the, um, 
the link to the to the silsila to the ch chain of transmission is established. This is an example of my own ejaza, um, and here you see the three signatures of um, my three teachers: Hassan Chalevi, Daoud Bektash, and Muhammad Zakiria. In the bottom, um, this was a, a, a very uh, famous masterwork by Izet Effendi, which I copied. And then once um, the ijaza was um, was given and accepted, um, it, it is also customary to have it illuminated. Um, this this piece is illuminated by Aitan Tiriaki, who's a very famous muzahib uh, from Istanbul as well. And um, as you can see, the 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 learning process continues. <laughs> so. Um, the the relationship with the teacher will continue, and then the student will start uh, working with larger works, more complex works, and so on. This is uh, with my teacher Daud Bektash. Um, and just as an anecdote, uh, to insist on the fact that the jaza is not the end, but just the beginning, um, someone asked my master when I received the jaza, um, how do, how did you know that um, that the student is at the level to be given the jaza, and he said, "Well, I know that you're a level where you cannot go backwards. Meaning, it, it is not that you are <laughs> wonderful or, or that you have attained any sort of uh, level of perfection, but you are at a stable le le level where, inshallah, the student will continue to progress. And it is for this reason that it's very important to maintain this relationship with the teacher." It is also after um, we have passed all these uh, points in the curriculum that then the student can start uh, creating new pieces. And here you, I've put some examples of architecture. Um, these are the very beautiful examples of the Sofia, which is, um, you see these big calligraphic panels by Izet Effendi. This is the Mosque of Suleimania. All right, so now this, um, I'm not sure if you have this tradition in Pakistan, but um, one of the traditions which is very uh, particular to the Ottoman tradition is this uh, concept of the calligraphic panel. Um, sometimes uh, people ask me, as a calligrapher, what do you do? Because people think of calligraphers as just writing pieces for the art of the book or writing the Quran or writing pieces for an calligraphic album, which was the case for many centuries, um, or doing pieces for architecture. However, from the um, beginning of the 17th century, we see um, in the Ottoman uh, calligraphic tradition the emergence of what we call the calligraphic panel, um, meaning calligraphy written on paper, which can then be hung on the wall uh, to contemplate. And in my opinion, this has been um, there was a certain influence by the Byzantine um, idea of the icon. And as you can see here, um, this is an example of a hilie. Hilie um, is the description of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which existed in the book format, uh, obviously. It's, it's based on a hadith by Sayyidina Ali. Um, and then uh, around the late 17th century, uh, Hafiz Osman, started um, to create a, a format in which the helio was written on paper and then it was glued on wood and it was hung on the wall to be displayed very much as, an, as a calligraphic icon we can see and this is an example you can see in the center very small is the helio then you have the small husna the small nabi and you have also different helios smaller helios on each side um, which describe the um, I think there are different helios of different prophets. And this is an example of what a, a, a normal, uh, let's say, levha uh, calligraphic panel will look like when you have it framed and, and hung on the wall in the style of jelly food. So <laughs> here I'm showing you what happens before this. Um, sometimes uh, 
there is there is a common notion um, among students that a very good calligrapher will um, just take a column and take a piece of paper and just write in a very spontaneous way and create a perfect composition. But in fact, uh, this is not the case, uh, especially not in the in the Ottoman school, um, because a lot of care was given to creating this very very detailed uh, compositions where everything counts, every millimeter, every hair width, um, the posi the exact position of every harike, every uh, ornament. So. Um, in fact, what happens before we produce a panel like this, we do uh, a very in-depth study. Um, and here's an example of the different faces. This is one of my pieces, and it's a bit embarrassing to show you, but you can see, uh, really, it's to show you what how, how we elaborate uh, a piece from uh, beginning to end. So as you can see, Already this was a lot of previous work before this image. Uh, with a smaller column, we, we make the sketches and we, we try to, to arrive to a harmonious composition. Then we take the larger column. Um, when we take the larger column, of course, we always measure with a knock test to make sure that the proportions are correct. And then we will start um, refining and changing and altering and very much um, polishing. So uh, we arrive to a final um, composition. And here you see here, um, this is more finalized. You can see the different positions of the, of the ornaments, of the harike and the vowels. And uh, the corrections in red are my own corrections, thinking how I'm going to change things or alter things, etc. And then this is the, the final piece, which as you can see, um it's uh there's nothing that has been left uh, to spontaneity in a sense but you need to sure that it's spontaneous when you're creating the piece mm -hmm. very beautiful <laughs> thank you so uh, now this is another example also uh by the great uh, halim effendi who's one of the great calligraphers from the mid uh, 20th century um and he also, here you see a calip, uh, meaning this, this template that we work on, and then the final piece um, on the right. So as you can see as well, um, there's this whole process of studying and, and, and really refining um, the details to really... Uh, there's always this, this uh, concept of striving for perfection, uh, which is very important in, in this school. Um, and now uh, I would like to uh, show you a, a bit of a case study of this concept of creating uh, something new uh, in the classical school. So the concept of creativity, if, if we can use this word. So obviously we will always respect the, the form of the letter and we will respect the, the, the rules um, that are involved in the compositions, but uh, we can definitely create uh, something new. So um, here you see the very famous uh, Basmala uh, with the elongated Kishida before the meme, which obviously it has been written many, many times throughout the centuries and we continue to write it. But um, this can be written in many different ways. So I'm just going to show you some examples, um, contemporary and past. Uh, this is uh, Sorry, this is a piece by um, Yilmaz Turan. And then here is the same piece, um, but with different slight variations by different calligraphers. So we see here uh, Halim Effendi, um, we see Mehmed Ozje, we see Yilmaz Turan, we see Daoud Bektash, we see Jawad Khuran, and you can see how every calligrapher has done a slightly different interpretation of the same um, composition. And here you see uh, calligraphers which have gone even a step further. Always 
to the, the same elements, but you can see how uh, also it's it's important to note that the Thulu style is a very, um, it's a style that lends itself to a lot of uh, different compositions because there are many forms for each letter. So uh, in a sense, it's it's for this reason that it's a very artistic, um, artistic uh, calligraphic style. Here you see again the basmala and you can see how they have uh, introduced the element of the of the we call this the kuppe in Turkish meaning the loop for the jim and the, the ha. And again a similar concept but different. Here we have the concept of uh, Muthenna, the mirror image and you can see uh, the piece by Hamid, and then the piece on the bottom is by a Pakistani calligrapher, um, Rashid um, Boot. And here, um, again, we see another um, element, which is um, the Basmala with the Kishide after the scene that elongates in a circle, and we see three different uh, versions of the same thing. So you can see just one sentence, um, how many possibilities, uh, and, and these are uh, from the past and present, and, and you know, man, many more could, <laughs> could evolve. This is yet another one by Ahmed Faris, a very, um, an, an excellent calligrapher, Egyptian calligrapher. And here we see the basma in the zoomorphic context by Rakim. This is um, 18th century. Another one by Hamid. Hamid Aitach from the 20th century. This is by the calligrapher Mehmed Ozjain. And you see the way the Kishida is elongated and the combination of the circle as well from the Kishida of the scene. And then we have yet another uh, another very interesting example. This is by my teacher, Daud Bektash, where um, if you're familiar with the Tura, which is um, on the top, I've put a, an image of the a very classical Tura of Sultan Suleiman, um, which uh, perhaps you're familiar with this. Um, the legal documents uh, written in the Ottoman court were written in the form of a firman, in the style of... Um, Divani style. Divan comes from Divan. And um, at the top of these legal documents was always the signature of the Sultan. And it has become a very, very much of an Ottoman emblem. Um, as soon as you see this, you, you, you recognize um, that it's Ottoman. And every Sultan had a different signature. And there are certain elements um, which are fixed elements, like the, the vertical strokes and the big loop on the left. And um, what uh, Daud Bektash has done in the bottom is he has taken the sort of static elements of the Tura and then created the Basmala. He has put the Bisma on the right, and then the Allah are the three vertical strokes with the big loop, and the Rahman and Rahim inside the, the eye of the Allah. And finally, I, I finish with the, the oldest example example by Ahmed Karahisari, um, a, a, a wonderful calligrapher from the 16th century. And this is in the Muselsal style. And you can see uh, how, in a sense, contemporary uh, this is. But this shows you how rich the art of calligraphy is. And um, it is in this sense that, um, finally, I would like to this is the, the, the Musel Selvasmala in its context. It's actually inside a book. And we have the Kufic. Um, uh, we have a Kufic uh, image in the bottom. Then, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a Kufic uh, calligraphic composition in the bottom, the Vasmala in the center, and another composition in the top. So um, I would like just to finish with um, this concept of what makes uh, masterwork. So a lot has been said about 
for instance, geometry and calligraphy, um, whenever you have points, lines, and proportions, there is, of course, geometry. But um, this is only one aspect, um, because as we have seen, um, we also have the, the, the almost invisible um, measures, like the hair width, the half hair, uh, etc. No, when, when we look at a, at a piece, the student will develop what we call the, the education of the eye. And there's a, a process which we see in students, and I mean, which all calligraphers have undergone, which is you develop um, there's certain veils at the beginning. Every calligraphy you look at seems wonderful. And then gradually you start distinguishing good calligraphy from bad calligraphy. Gradually you start distinguishing this is by this master, this is by this other master. And you know that it's like layers that are lifted until you arrive to a, a a good understanding of what the archetypical perfect letter looks like. No, and this is what we try to teach students. To. So in your mind's eye, you need to visualize um, this perfect letter, this perfect wow, or this perfect noon. And you're always striving to create uh, this perfection, even though obviously we will always be. Um, we will we will not always be successful, but there's always this uh, this uh, archetype that needs to be present. So um, <clears throat> when we have a masterwork, there is obviously um, this aspect of of proportion of uh, the letters are written almost perfectly. But then there's another. Um, element which uh, the Persians called the, the Shan of the piece and um, we can say that it's the, the Makam of the piece and this is I, in English we would say something which is a little bit um, perhaps reductionist but let's say the aura of the piece you know so um, when we see old masterworks there is a very strong presence of the sacred but there's a certain energy you know, that is uh, given from this piece. So how can we as, as um, contemporary calligraphers uh, try to, to embody this or try to transmit this? And the answer, of course, there's no answer <laughs> to this because it's something that it's either there or it's not. But it's a very important element. So meaning that sometimes you can have a, a perfect letter or a perfect composition and have absolutely no shan, no nothing that is conveyed from this piece and sometimes you can have a piece which perhaps is less perfect or but it will have a, a, a very strong energy which will will convey this um, presence of the sacred so all of these are elements which are important to keep in mind especially today we obviously we have technology we have a lot of different elements that are coming um, interacting with with the traditional calligraphy and it is important to, to be conscious of, this, of the intangible aspects of calligraphy, which we need to preserve. And um, inshallah. Um, so um, I think this is about it. Uh, let me just see because, yes, this is about it. So, so perhaps we could have a discussion now if you, you have questions or. Yes, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, I think the students really enjoyed it. Uh, I don't know where now you could see them. Yes. No, no, I, I, I couldn't see you. This is why it was a bit difficult for me. I apologize because I could only see my slides and I couldn't see your faces. And I, I normally interact more with the public. Yes. <laughs> but sorry, but uh, we really, we, all of us enjoyed it. All right, thank you. So we can, we can let the students uh, say if it, uh, can you read that message from Tanya? Uh, yes, I see. Thank you. Uh, She's uh, attending from Dubai. Uh huh. Thank All you. right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful session. Thank you. So we are very fortunate that Nuria did one of our first sort of architectural projects for us. Uh, anybody wants to say anything? I will leave another question. Uh, Nabil wants to ask a question. Yes. Hello, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Alec